All right, so today I'm here on Zoom with uh, my friend Mark Walsh. Mark is uh, an experienced entrepreneur and investor. Mark and I have worked together for many years as investors and business owners together. And I asked Mark to join me today because I've talked a lot with you about how to start businesses, what the entrepreneurial journey looks like. Today, we want to spend 15 or so minutes and talk a bit about what it looks like to succeed. So, Mark, thanks a lot for joining our entrepreneurship class here at MU. It's, it's great to have you on Zoom. T great to be us, here. Absolutely. Tell us, uh, tell my students a bit about your your life's journey, because I think you're indicative of the kind of uh, people that I want my students to have the experience of being. How flattering. Um, I may convince them otherwise after I go through my background, but Possible. I think the, the, the cynic might say that I can't hold a job but I would argue the exact reverse, which is I was lucky enough early on in my career to find an arena that was relatively unformed, had a lot of opportunity. It's called the Internet. And I joined it before the Internet was even called the Internet, just to so give you some some background um, so that I was able to uh, participate in a lot of different companies at a lot of different roles. Most of the time, thankfully, climbing up the ladder to where I became C-suite, if not CEO itself. Uh, where, where I saw a lot happening. And, um, but before I get to that part, let me tell you, I, I came out of college and, and, and didn't really know what to do. I was an American studies major. So I moved to a small town in West Virginia and my friend of my parents ran a TV station there. And I joined the TV station as a salesman selling time. Um, I had some on-air experience in my high school. We had a little, little closed circuit TV station. So the general manager promoted me to weatherman. I was weatherman live online, uh, live at six and 11, then I became weather and sports, then I became the anchorman, uh, then I became the news director and anchorman. I was the youngest anchorman in America. These were all happened very rapidly, just so you know, progression, uh, promotion and sort of battlefield. So the idea of going to a small arena, small, small pond and getting to be a big fish rapidly, I am a huge proponent of that because I think earlier in your career, you can accelerate quite rapidly where the stakes are bluntly lower, which is usually small markets, smaller companies, small arena. Um, so I was a, I was a uh, recipient of that uh, battlefield promotion rapidness, which let me apply to Harvard Business School and be accepted because I, Harvard Business School loves people with kind of a, a shtick and Mike Shtick was the youngest TV anchor man for a CBS television affiliate. It wasn't, you know, uh, 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 all cable. Um, so MBA from there got me into the, into the mainstream and I joined Home Box Office, which at the time was a startup within Time Inc, uh, changing television, premium television. And that really got me into what is really the Internet. So the idea of being on a disruptive company, in the case of HBO, real brand uh, inside the mothership of Time Incorporated, which was a fabulous company, media company, and, and being in the media business um, and moving up there was, was incredible. Once I got in the media business, I realized that the media business, and we all see this every day, is far broader than just being you know, media, like watching a show. And that's where I got introduced to the Internet. So I joined, I actually started a little company with a partner, um, which didn't work out, and we'll get to that. Uh, he and I had an unamicable splitting. And then after that, I got into what was then called the online industry. Uh, I was actually introduced to with my partner, and we had an unamicable splitting. And then the online business became internet business. Internet business became what we now know today, which is effectively new media. So to the point of your question, long answer, um, I was really lucky, and luck has a lot to do with it, by the way, uh, really lucky to be in places where the structure of the uh, of the company that I worked for, the structure of the market we were in, the structure of what consumers and customers expected, the structure of vendor and supplier and partner relationships was relatively squishy. So in the end that in those unformed arenas, I found great comfort. Um, and I would argue final point that unformed arenas and finding comfort in it is something that entrepreneurs should be quite fluent in because when you're starting a company or with a high growth, hopefully high growth, small company that you've joined, a lot of it is unstructured. So being used to that is a core competency that I was lucky enough to either have or develop. So basically, it, it conceptually, the more static a situation is, the less likely there's going to be for some new entrance or some new individual to be able to make hay, right? So you've really got to be in an environment that's dynamic or amenable to giving a younger person or even older person room to run. That's what you're saying, right? 
Yes, and I have one quick example where that's tough. I worked for General Electric, GE, uh, and I ran a, an, a competitor to AOL, if you remember America Online, and um, that was an unformed entity with a lot of opportunity, making it up, you know, mailing disks like AOL did, and I knew AOL quite well, but I was a competitor, and I literally presented to Jack Welch this opportunity, and he sort of got it, but didn't really get it. But underneath Jack Welch was an entire tier at GE that was about predictability, about making light bulbs, about making jet engines, about making railroad engines, about, about appliances, predictability, cost of capital, size of market, real financial engineering stuff. And I, my business had none of that. So the collision between the environment I was in, General Electric financial engineering, and Holy moly, this crazy growth stuff called online with AOL and Genie and Prodigy and the internet, that collision was very, very uncomfortable. Um, it, it, I learned a lot <laughs> hanging out with Jack Welch, but it, it, was, it, was a, it was not a recipe for success. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned a few moments ago, luck. And I'm often struck by how few of our peers who are successful seem to be willing to admit that they were lucky. Why? Why do you think that is? And what is the role of luck in a successful career? Well, I agree with you that a lot of people we know, and certainly a lot of people that have become, you know, gods of technology or media are, uh, are reticent to admit that, that they're lucky. And I just remind people, look at Hollywood. I mean, for every Harrison Ford, for every Mel Gibson, there's 50, 500, 5,000 talented actors just like them waiting tables. And getting a hit movie and having your career blossom, you also see people getting a hit movie and having their career stunt and then go down. This is, this is the example of business. I think Hollywood is a lot closer to business as far as careers and luck than people would like to realize, number one. Number two, um, in my opinion, the higher up, at least I've seen, the higher up executives get in larger and larger corporations, the more they actually do start to drink their own Kool-Aid. And that's okay, that's human nature. I think in entrepreneurial companies, people that have success in growing a company from zero revenue to a million to five to 10, from two employees to 10 to 50 to 150, that they see is a journey filled with potholes, I should say, uh, rife with potholes, rife with challenges and, and potential death-defying acts. So I think those people that succeed in that zone from zero to 15 million in revenue, from zero to 150 people in, in, as employees, I think they always know that it's luck to get there. Hmm. So where does it, so how do we parse that with, I think a belief you and I both have that you have to really be prepared, right? I mean, so is, is, is the way to, way to think about it that you have to be in the game and work like an animal to get to the point where you can be lucky. But in business, you know, we don't know anybody who's successful who just woke up one day and just happened to them. Right? You have to get in the way of luck, I think is what I'm suggesting. Well said. The people that wake up and success was handed to them are the sons of people that worked hard and, and were lucky, or, 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 or daughters, I should say, or the children of, of people that have yes. that. Look, I, um, I have, you and I have said to each other, and I've said to many um, MBA law school and other uh, mentorship in, environments, that the highs are higher and the lows are lower. So unless your appetite for exhilaration and desperation is pretty strong, uh, you might think about avoiding this because that may sound like we're bipolar and maybe a little bit of that is going on, but um, everybody, everybody has dark days where they're like, what did I do? Why did I leave that company to start this? Why did I screw that customer relationship up? Why did I tell my VC something I shouldn't have and now they're nervous about my prospects. Why, 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 why? And there's a million whys that will upset you and maybe haunt you forever. I, I can name you five on this Zoom of things I wish I'd done really differently because it, it cost me a lot of time, a lot of money, some, some cases, some relationships. Um, but I, I treasure the high points too, uh, the victory, some of them very small, but like so emotionally valuable to me. So that, that high beta, you know, high, high, low, low, is a feature of sort of why we do this. I think the second thing and final point and maybe the point of your question is, uh, you gotta believe. 
Um, you're right. You, you just really got to believe that the thing you're doing is a good thing. Uh, it's good for you. Hopefully it'll make you some dough, but it's good for, it's good for your soul. Hopefully it's good for humanity. I'm not saying you have to all be, you know, feeding the poor, but it's, you know, it's good for the overall world we live in and that it's good in that you want to express it to other people, i.e. you believe in it, you're a proselytizer, you're preaching the gospel. If those three buttons aren't kind of hit, I have found most people just don't want to get up and do the extra work that you're talking about. This reminds me very early on as I was making the change from being a venture capital lawyer and a finance guy to uh, starting the amplifier, you and I sat down and, and you asked me why I wanted to do it. And, uh, and I told you I want to get rich. Remember that conversation? Do you I remember do. the advice? Share it with my friends here. Well, I, I mean, this may, this may upset some folks watching. I said, don't do this to get rich. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, when you first suit up for eighth grade basketball, don't do this to get in the NBA. <laughs> okay. It doesn't happen for most people. Do it because you love basketball. Do it because you love business. Do it because you love um, carving something out of a block of wood and having your initials and some others, because it's never one person. Uh, your initials, you know, kind of uh, uh, burned into the bottom uh, that you can look on and be proud of. Look, wealth, wealth gathering, in my experience, the people that make the most money are the people that set out not to make the most money. Sometimes you'll meet people in business school who say, look, all I want to do is make money. And then they tend to work in investment banks and they tend to be basically fee and wage locked into that wage and fee and bonus, right? Which is fine. And they can have fantastic wealth showered upon them if they're in the right bank at the right time with the right deals. But if you're looking to create wealth, the chances of the company you start generating, you know, generational wealth for you is relatively low. It's about the experience. And once you try it once, I would argue it's addictive. And even if you try it once and you fail, you can learn so much from failure that you say, I, I can do that again. And I know when not to do that and when not to do that. And I'll, I'll you know, I'll, I'll get the marble through the maze a little bit farther next time. And mm -hmm. That doesn't always mean money, but it sure means being interested in waking up every day psyched. So, and I think that's really, when I think about, you know, your and my friendship, I think we've known each other close to 20 years now. Uh, certainly what I've seen is that we are addicted to the journey. I mean, we're, you know, we, we're working with companies now as investors and mentors, we've done businesses together and it is addicting. There's no doubt about it. It becomes a life, it becomes a life choice. So that leads me to, I think, the million dollar question, forgive the pun, which is, what does success look like for people like you and me? You know, as we look and, and I talk with a bunch of really smart people that are starting their careers or building their careers, what does, how will they know they're successful? What does success look like? Well, I think I might have some bad news, um, or at least certainly not satisfying news. Because I don't know what success means, which means I'm still chasing it. Um, that's and, and, and that's okay. I, I, I believe in that. I believe in chasing it. Look, I think there are three buckets of success that you can, you can decide to pursue. It's sort of personal, career, and other. Um, I'll start with other. That can be spiritual. It can be you know, giving back, not for profit, stuff like that. So personal can be a family that you're happy with or a, a, a just a personal situation that gives you great personal pride or joy or satisfaction. It could be getting really good at something like, you know, ice skating or whatever, a hobby. Professional success to me is the most ephemeral and frankly, the least sustainable. You can have sustained success in the other. You can be in your board of your church and just, or your, your faith, your, your location of faith. Uh, in the personal side, you can have a personal relationship with a spouse that you find extraordinarily rewarding. Th those, can, those can exist and be stable, steady, and continually rewarding to you up and down the stack. But the center, career success, I think is always the most ephemeral. And I hate to quote the movie Wall Street, but as Bud Fox said to Gordon Gecko, how many yachts can you ski behind, right? This idea of constantly pursuing, now in the case of Gordon Gecko, it was money. That was his definition of success. Mine is not money, as we discussed earlier. But how many, how many yeses, how many wins, how many, how many pelts do you need to 
to nail to the wall before you go, I am a success. I can relax. I can move to Boca Raton and play golf. That's, I don't think that's in the DNA of entrepreneurs. Um, I have yet to find an entrepreneur uh, who decided to hang it up at 60 and play golf in Boca who didn't then come back and get in the game. Never mm -hmm. met one. Why? Mm -hmm. Because success continues to elude them. Final point, though. Success is the game. As one of the guys said in the movie Heat, you know, the action is the juice, right? Um, so I think success is in the career for entrepreneurs, success is staying relevant, being relevant, continually honing and sharpening your skills, adding value to a company, whether you're an advisor, a board member, an investor, an employee, a CEO, whatever, adding value every day. And I would argue that feeling then spills over into bucket one, personal, and bucket two, other. Yeah, that I think that's really, for me, that's exactly right. Success, success is living a life that I like living and having wins along the way, right? I mean, it's, it's a game. It's almost like it, it's like the ultimate multiplayer game, right? <laughs> well, the last thing, right? Go ahead. Yeah, the last thing is, is I think the last observation I'd make is I've been very struck of how money just makes me, money is a way that a lot of people measure success. But I think that the most successful people I know that are happy don't actually measure money by, they don't measure success by money. In other words, what I found is that money just makes people more who they are. It, you know, it, it, it makes you, because it frees them from the artifice, but it just, the, the biggest jerks I know that are wealthy were jerks before they became wealthy. Well, there's, there's a rich body of evidence of that. And I think famously, I'm not sure if President Obama said it, certainly it's been said many times, if you really want to, really want to get to know somebody, give them power. And I would argue that, that, that is true also for money. If you really want to get to know somebody's personality, give them a lot of money and see what they do with it, see how they use it as a weapon or as an opportunity, see how they allocate it, see how they respond when people ask them to donate it. Because guess what, boys and girls, if you are thought to have a lot of money, there'll be a lot of people that call you up. And a lot of times they're asking you for money, but they'll pretend not to. I wish I had a nickel for every time on LinkedIn, somebody said, hey, we have lots of people in common. Uh, I'd love to uh, buy you a cup of coffee and chat about my career or chat about the, the Washington commanders or chat about the weather or whatever. And when I look at their career, they're in wealth management. And I'm like, okay, I, I get it. You're, you know, you're trying to sell your services to me. I'm not bragging, believe me, but I, this, this, this happens, service same industries. With, yeah, it's the same. Yeah. same. So, so this, is, this is the new world we're in, which is people sniff out these assets and they, and, and they pursue it. But I, but I also, to, to your point, um, I, I think that, uh, I think it is a, it is a revealer capital access to capital acquiring capital is a revealer and a lens as opposed to a changer. Yeah. In other words, we, we are who we are and, and if we can find ways to be happy, whether it's working for a company or being in an entrepreneurial activity, we got to be honest with ourselves about what makes us happy. So we choose the right career path. Well, also about people, um, I agree with you, people don't change. And the worst mm -hmm. investments I've ever made, the worst company environments where I was an employee or a manager uh, is where I thought I could change people. You know, I adopted the wounded puppy and thought I'll change that man or that woman or, oh, my boss is an, uh, is an ass, but you know, I'll, I'll learn to work with them and be productive. Or I invested in an entrepreneur and the, and the CEO and founder is a schmuck, but you know, we'll, we'll, we'll put a donut around him or her and we'll give them training and all this stuff. It, it virtually always hasn't worked out. People are people. And what you often see pretty early on is what you're going to get. Very, very few times do people change, maybe even like Sigma Zero. So you got to bet on the, on, the, on the people in the environment first is what, what I found. And I'll finish with this, which is the only asset we have in this goddamn planet is time. And if you waste time trying to change people that ain't going to change, then that asset is gone forever. And I don't care how much money you make, you'll never get that asset back. Mm. So any final thoughts for a, a group of really energetic young people that would love to make their way in the world? So uh, as the old Chinese curse said, may you live in interesting times. It is well, a curse. <laughs> yeah, it, that is today. Uh, I don't remember a time that so many supposedly reliable features of global society are 
under duress. And um, all, I guess it's a, it's a horrible piece of advice, but all I would suggest to the audience is stay nimble and stay nimble personally, stay nimble professionally, stay nimble from an observational standpoint. And as hard as it may sound, try and make yourself happy. Because I do believe that, that you can control a significant portion of your own self-satisfaction, your own happiness, your own, your own sunny attitude. I honestly believe, not that you wake up and go, by God, I'm happy, but don't let yourself become unhappy and you can turn that dial down. So it's up to you to stay nimble and be manager of your own happiness. Great words to live by. Mark Walsh, thanks for joining us today. This was really a lot of fun. Take care, everybody.